So when we talk about specific North West, we are talking about part of America. So a lot of the characteristics that we see right now um, do exist in places like Oregon, Washington, but also looking at like British Columbia in Canada and all the way up into, of course, Alaska. And so this is a recent, and you, you see that there's a series of islands and peninsulas. So water is really important to their culture, as well as the natural resources that we see in their environment. And so they use a lot of those natural materials. So those hardy woods that come from the trees that this region is known for is the main subject matter, or the main media, I should say, for our Kwakawa Transformation Act. Okay, so remember we saw this on Thursday. And so what I wanted to do is to kind of hit home main ideas of this. What do the animals represent? In Pacific culture, or North, South, excuse me, in um, North, Northern Pacific culture, right? What do animals often represent? They would have that in their notes. Let's just dissect it a little bit. When we look at it in the open phase, we have a person, right? When we have it in the closed phase, we have a bird of some sort. And then when we look at it, we have birds on the inside and bears. Right? I I compared this to totem poles. What are totem poles for? What are totem poles for? Remembering ancestors? Exactly. They represent your ancestors. That's where you're getting your identity. So often in the Pacific Northwest, you get your identity from your ancestors. And so certain animals represent your clan or your people. Remember that they do it in a very abstract way, right? This is not a perfect representation of what a person looks like. I can't look like that and go, oh, that is Uncle George, right? But it's a, you know, just a stylized version of a person, a stylized version of a bear and a eagle or a raven or some sort of hawk, right? And this is done in that four line style, which is really common. If you're a football fan, the Seattle Seahawks, right? Their logo is done in this style, right? Where it's very abstracted, filled with broad, like curvilinear strokes. They look like lines on the verge of these shapes, right? Very flat. And they often have that contour rivalry that we talked about, where the bear merges with the bird. They share the same eye, right? So there's this sense of intentionally kind of confusing or creating some sort of merge that has like an optical illusion to it. So we saw that at Chavni, right? So this is in South America. This is in like an ancient South American society, very you know, far away from the Pacific Northwest. So we looked at the Koch Catlatch, our potlatch, and we talked about how this was a ceremony, right, that was used by the people to kind of tell stories, right, about their ancestors. But it also was the area where people could share wealth with their people. So this would be some sort of ceremony, often used for like initiation ceremonies. But I wanted to show you. You know, when we see these maps in a museum, they're very static. I want to show you how they're used. So we're not going to watch this whole video. We'll just watch a few minutes of it. So notice the lighting, right? This is going to be like firelight or spark torch. And so it kind of has a very mysterious sort of feel to it. And notice that the wear of the map takes on the persona of the character. Look at the mannerisms, right? Notice how they're kind of covered from head to toe to the sky. Our very beginning of 
through a world of transformation. We had all of our first ancestors transformed from other beings. And so from that point on, through our evolution, masks have played an integral part of the things we do, the things we say we stand for, the things we believe in. When we take these masks to dance, uh, they're, they're more than just intricately carved objects. They have a very uh, real significance and symbolism. They relate to a lot of the things we perceive to be in the spirit world that we should, should acknowledge and understand because that's where we're all hid in the, in the final analysis. That's where we're going to be. The masks then become almost like snapshots of endless time. Way, way, way before white people came, before Europeans actually sat here, masks to those people, to my ancestors, were very, very important. They were things that you just didn't see laying around. Now, today, you can go downtown and you can go to any of the you can go to any of the galleries and you can walk in there and you can look at their walls and you can say, I want that mask. I want that mask. And you'll put out dollars for that mask. But masks to my people, to my mom's people, my dad's people, those weren't just things to be hanging on the walls and things that you could purchase. They earned the right to have those. Okay, so what he's getting at, right? is this idea that these are sacred objects, right? They're sacred things that are used in his ceremonies that relate to the creation stories of his people, the formation of their families, their connection with their natural world. So when we look at the kind of, um, remember these top latches were used uh, to share wealth amongst the community, and they were often part of um, some sort of initiation or healing of the people, or just the telling of your ancestry. These would give you, you know, stories of your history. And so they represent your ancestors. So what he was getting at is that these would be sacred objects to these people. This would not be something that you would decorate your home with. This is, these are things that would just be pulled out for special ceremony. And certain people could wear these. It's not like everyone in the society was able to wear these masks and wear the costumes that went with it during the ceremonies, right? So they were very, you know, it was an honor to be able to perform and to take on the personas of the ancestors as well as these different creation stories. So if you remember, right, that often the animals are ones that are native to the region. And normally are based on the major clans of the different people. So for ours, we have an eagle, right? We have a bird, right? It's either an eagle or a raven. But often people are associated with killer whales, with um, wolves, and well. And so these animals open and close to reveal human as well as animal realistic components. Right? And they all talk about um, that creation story. So how we have the cycle of the sun, the moon, fire, salmon, rain, and thunder, of course, are all important to understanding the tides, understanding the water, understanding fishing, and whaling in this region. So if you remember, this was outlawed in Canada for a while because um, the, the, the colonizers in here thought that they were possibly like cannibals because during the dances, these creatures, these, these transformation maps would open and close and look like they're biting and eating people in the dance. They didn't show that in our little clip, but supposedly that was one reason they believed it. Um, also in the Pacific Northwest, this chill pot. This is actually worn. Um, this is kind of in the border of Alaska and Canada. And so these 
are blankets that are worn um, by the people for different ceremonies. And the patterns are created by men and the women tend to do the weaving. We saw this in Pacific culture too. Remember that women often do like the soft materials um, and they often do a lot of the weaving. And so the symbols that we see on this is very similar to that transformation mask. You can see that there's kind of this contour rivalry where imagery merges with each other. The whole thing kind of looks like a bear at the base. Can you guys see the eyes and the ears? But then when you look in the middle, right, you see a human, right? So there's a lot of these kind of merging or kind of composite creatures that are created. And so this has these different animal components to them. And uh, oh, shoot. Um, here's that stamp that you can buy now if you want. So this is a chill pack stamp by the US government. It's really pretty, right? But you can see that they're basically woven on a loom. And then they are basically worn, kind of like shawls. And so they have fringes on them so that when you dance, they become kind of activated. And these are also part of potlatch ceremonies. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and go to the Pacific, excuse me, we're going to the American Southwest next. We're going to be focusing on number 166, which is black on black ceramic vessel. You guys are going to need to go into um, Zoom. So go ahead, I forgot about seeing you guys on that when you came in. Right. We're going to divide and conquer. What I'm going to do is put you guys in groups. And so um, I'll put this in the breakout. When you are placed randomly in your breakout group, what you're going to do is group one is going to do question one. Group two is going to do question two and so on. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Smart History 166 for this piece. And we're going to focus on how the ceramic making is a community activity. How was these pots made? What kind of imagery references ancient practices? And what imagery is included? And then how they depict updates of the modern times. So basically for number four is how are they contemporary? How are they part of that modern time? Okay. So let me go ahead and get you guys Open up that document from the chat right now while I place you in your groups. Okay, so focus on your question. There's a slide for you. There, go ahead and enter. Uh, yes.
ahead and have group one explain what you guys did. So I apologize for not setting this up a little bit better with making there be someone who like maybe writes and someone who um, is going to be the, re, the re, like reply right to the group. But could someone from group one volunteer on how the ceramic making was a communal activity? You can go ahead and open your slide if you like. Um, if you guys want to open the slide to number one so that you can use these to jot down on your notes, that's fine. Let's go ahead and have someone read it for the group. So someone from group one. So yeah. Isabel or Isabella or Katie. Yeah, so um, potters would share tasks throughout the process like um with mixing paint or polishing the slip or forming the like shape of it so that's what maria martinez did um and then like other people would decorate the pots right so it's not just something that one person often makes and that's kind of common with a lot of artists think about it you know michelangelo when he was painting the ceiling didn't do all the work himself right he would have someone you know, make the plaster, someone else would apply the plaster, someone would help him put the cartoon up, and then he would do a lot of the painting. So you know, it's very common for there to be a workshop of people making these pieces. So there was a big division of labor. Um, some of the things you mentioned, I have a couple edited ones as well, is that they tended to make the clay. So instead of importing clay from you know, other places, they made clay based on the natural supply in the area. So often people in the community would make the clay for her, right? Or, and her husband. And then Maria Martinez, she would make the pottery herself, her husband in particular, and then after his death, her sons started to decorate the pottery, right? Certain people in the community would run the kilns and they would often make these in the good of the people. Once she was famous, Maria Martinez was famous in her own lifetime. She was really known for this black on black pottery. Once she made a name, she would often sign the name, her name on the artwork of other artists in the community so that it would bring wealth and prosperity to the region. Right. So her pieces were very popular with people who went, you know, collectors. So people who were interested in pottery, interested in the art world, but also, of course, people who go on, you know, vacations to the Southwest, people would buy these things and bring them home. Okay. So the next question was, how was this pot made? Right. How was this pot made? So someone from group two, so Cora, Jeffrey, Rahil. Can I get a volunteer uh, to read off yeah. your slide? Thank you. Um, so the clay was spun locally um, and then it was mixed with a temper of uh, powered broken pots. Um, then it was mixed with water so that it could be uh, formed into different shapes. And then it was dried and covered in slip, which is a thin solution of clay and water and then polished by rubbing it with a smooth stone. Right. So it it's definitely has um, different elements of it. Probably the only thing that I didn't hear you say was how she used coil method. Um, many students who take ceramics or have experimented with pottery in like elementary school or middle school have done this process before. And so basically what they do, right? Here it's making of clay. Um, you can see it here. Here's a picture of Maria Martinez actually um, making her pieces. So notice how she has a mold, right? She has a bowl at the base. And then what she would do is ro roll coils, so like snakes of clay, and she would spiral them and then smooth them by hand. You can watch her make the, her pieces. There's lots of people who uh, recorded her making work. And I've got de definitely some links here that we can watch on our own later to see her process. And so she makes it seem really easy. She smooths it by hand. And then here her husband is painting on the surface with the slip, right? And then they use slip with um, some 
like natural material in it. So they use Sorry, thank you. Someone caught me not sharing, I apologize. Feel free to come on the audio if I ever forget to hit the resume, right? So here we go, right? So here you can see her rolling the snakes and then coiling them around and smoothing them and she'll use a mold. So that will make it so that it holds the shape. If you didn't do that, it would wanna flat, flatten with gravity. And then here's her husband painting them, right? And so basically what she does is she covers them in black slip. Anything that is shiny has been smoothed with a rock. So if you press, right, with a hard surface onto something that is like, we call it leather hard, um, it's got a little bit of moisture. If you press, you're compressing the surface and it will make it shiny. You could actually do this on a piece of paper. If you took a spoon, right? Like the smooth part of a spoon and you took an, a piece of paper, like a sketchbook piece of paper, if you rubbed on it, you would see that the surface would get shinier because you're smoothing out the surface. And so that's where these shiny parts come from. And then they used a process of firing that's really specific. And we'll get to that in just a little bit that made it black on black because it doesn't it doesn't start off black on black that's part of the firing process right so right so then right how does the imagery reference ancient practices right what are the ancient practices that were used in this piece that was done much later so group three, Alana, Emily, there we go. First, oh, Varun was in that group too. Anyone wanna volunteer? Uh, yeah, so like the design is like from like their ancestral like dig sites, like based off like the imagery is based off a lot of like their ancestors. And they also like followed a lot of the natural phenomena that they saw around them. Like the rain clouds, birds, feathers, and like other stuff they would just have in their everyday natural world. Right. And that's like uh, some other design aspects as well. Exactly. And so keeping in mind, we looked at the ancestral Pueblo before. That was at Mese Verde. Remember how they painted their walls with the kind of these geometric designs? And so in a national park today, we call it Bandelier, Bandelier National Monument. Um, there was a dig there and her, Maria and her husband were kind of a part of this research um, team. And they went in and they excavated this ancestral Pueblo um, area and found shards of this ancient pottery. And so they recreated a lot of the designs as well as this black on black method from them. And so they were trying to recreate this ancient style that they had. And so like Varun said, a lot of the imagery employed on this, when you look at it necessarily, you're not quite like, that definitely looks like a bird. It's a very abstract version of a bird, right? Um, they, these designs tend to accentuate the like the most um, important part of the vessel. So notice how she creates this band along the belly or what we call the shoulder of the piece, right? So, or she emphasizes the neck, right? This narrower part of the design, okay? And then lastly, right? Oh, sorry, here's some typical works of her. I wanna make sure we saw some different shapes here. This one is probably a little bit more obvious. What's on both of these, what's the abstraction? Can you guys tell? What are these images of? Katie, can you, can you see? What does this look like it could be an image of? something based on the natural world? Um, plate looks like it could be like a sun. Maybe. The shape in the middle and with these rays on the outside, I could definitely see how it's the sun. If we look at this Ola, which is this round vase, these things coming down also look like what? 
See if it's on this list. A bird in flight. Is anything reminiscent of a bird or a bird in flight? Don't these kind of look like feathers? Right, so they're abstracted feathers. Okay, last one, group four, right? Group four, so this is Quana and Jasmine. Um, how are these designs updated for modern times? How has this abstraction been, um, you know, transformed to reflect the time in which she made these? There was a general emphasis on um, instead of making a utilitarian object, it was more about making something beautiful for fine art. So um, they blackened it with the powdered anier, which made it less sturdy and watertight, but it had like the black color that was really popular at the time. And it was also burnished to be shiny. Mm -hmm. And the dramatic bolus shape reflects other art movements. I think it was called the art Echo, so it's a very dramatic shape. Right, and I have a slide to help you guys with that because you guys all know Gatsby, right? So this was made, these kinds of styles, this art deco style is basically around the 1920s, right? And so art deco is a style where we, they actually use a lot of natural imagery. So they will often um, abstract and use really bold geometric patterns um, and colors. And so you can see how it's really stylized and made to seem more geometric. So that was a good point about the utilitarian function. You know, to ancient peoples, these would have been objects that were been used for everyday use or ceremonial purposes. Um, so they would often be made watertight. But because she was selling these as art, it was okay that they were more porous. Because they don't have glaze, water would seep through this. A good example would be like those terracotta red pots that people put plants in, right? They're not sealed, so the water evaporates out the sides of them. Okay, good. So we're gonna go ahead and move to another region of the Americas. Um, we're going to um, look at the influence of Europeans on the artworks of the Eastern Woodlands and Plain um, Indians. And so the first one that we have is the Lenape people. This is the bandolier, a bandolier bag. Now the Lenape people were from um, a certain, like they were from this region in um, kind of like um, the Eastern United States. So we're kind of moving and shifting. And you can see how their territory um, you know, moved and expanded based on the populations of uh, people colonizing into the Americas. And so I'm not going to have you guys draw it. Normally, I hand out a handout of this and have people draw the design. But when you look at the patterning on this, um, does it represent any imagery? Can you recognize any imagery that you've seen before? Right? Does it look like anything in particular? Right. So when you look at it, it's very abstracted floral motifs. So like flowers or plant life, but also it almost feels like everything is in the form of a cross. And so often people connect these with the cardinal directions, right? So these images, these designs coming from the cardinal directions. So these designs are often, now we are looking at it from the context that these people came from the from Eastern um, United States. However, because of having to move and shift um, and move West, this tradition and this style of these bandolier bags become very common in the lands that we're living in. So in the, the plain states as well, because they had to migrate and shift to the West. And so when we look at these, we can see that stylization of plant life, we see the cardinal directions, but also we have these really bright colors. So the designs, right? They, they, I'll show you one that's a little bit earlier. 
But a lot of these designs, these abstracted designs, also came from the coloners themselves. So some of these come from different ethnic groups that were immigrating from Europe. And they reflect the prairie style or the patterns um, of where these people live based on these floral motifs. And it was very common to use contrasting colors. So what I mean by contrasting colors would be using warm and cool colors together or colors that are far away from each other on like the color wheel. So using cool blues with strong reds, right? And those would represent um, the contrasting world of like the celestial world and maybe the underworld. So like the living of the living, the world of the heavens and the world of like under the earth, almost like life and death, right? So we'd have these contrasting colors as well as these abstracted imagery that kind of feel like they are based on cardinal directions because of that cross format. So these are kind of interesting bags. Here we have a man um, wearing it using, um, this is like his ceremonial attire. So this is not necessarily his everyday, um, like, you know, dress for a Lenape man. Um, but when you look at it, the bag itself is not something that is native to the Americas. Does it look like something in particular that might have been common from people who colonized in this region who moved out west? To me, it kind of looks like a messenger bag, doesn't it? You guys know what I mean by a messenger bag? So it has a strap over one shoulder and then the bag hangs on the side so that you can move. Now, if I were a colonizer, so I, I was like, you know, a, a white man, right? Moving into these, these native lands. The first people to come were often people who were trading furs, right? So this would not be a vessel for, you know, holding furs or carrying your supplies. These were ammunition bags. So the Lenape took these European styled ammunition bags, things that you would keep your bullets and your, and your um, gunpowder in, right? And they, they made it into um, ceremonial attire for people, right? So this was the style of bag is not native to the Lenape. They, they appropriated and changed this ammunition bag from the people who came to colonize and these hunters, right? So the materials that they used are also not local, right? Does anyone know where they would have gotten the ribbons and the cloth and the beads? They traded for them, right? The Lenape, as well as many other North American um, groups, would often use porcupine needles to do this quilling, and they would make their own beads. But after colonization, they could get it cheaper, they could get really bright colors, and so they started to trade their goods and things like furs and um, hides and so on with the Europeans. And so they would um, get these really bright colored beads, um, often coming from Eastern Europe, as well as places like Venice, right? Because Venice is known for its glass work. And so they would buy these little beads that were brightly colored. And so the feathers, the colors would shimmer in the sunlight. Here are some other designs. You can see how they become more complicated. They're not all as bold and simple as the one that's in our 250. This one is much more intricate. So all of this little detail work here is all stitched beads. It's almost like a sequence dress in a way, right? Um, the, I think the last piece we have is a hide painting. This is a hide painting of the Sundance. And we actually know the name of the artist for this one as well. Um, this was made by um, Kadzi Kode. Um, and he was a, um, a Shoni, um, he was from the Shoni tribe, 
And the Eastern Shoni group, um, they were pushed off their territorial lands and were placed into um, a very famous uh, reservation in Wyoming. So they, he was in the Wind River Reservation when he made this. And so this is a photo of him, right? And so possible functions, right? These animal hides had a lot of functions for them. For the traditional people, right? They record events. So any sort of important event, this one says it's made for a sun dance, right? Could be recorded on this. It also could be some sort of wall hanging. Now, when I say a wall hanging, a wall hanging could be a sort of decoration, but it also could be something that was placed inside or outside of like a teepee or a house to help insulate and to protect the walls. And it also could be, some of these um, hide paintings could also be transformed into some sort of rope. So sort of like that chill cap blanket that we saw, it could be wrapped around someone um, to protect them from the elements. Now, our theme for today is the influence of the um, colonization or the colonizers on the art of the natives. And so this one was actually made on that reservation, but it was solely made for selling to tourists, right? So when Cody was making his hide paintings, he was making them thinking about, okay, people who come to Wyoming want that Indian experience, right? He wa they want to have this idea that they are coming to this land that is uh, based on like, you know, history and what things were like in the past and, you know, kind of like that old sort of Wild West motif. And so he intentionally thought about what kind of imagery he was going to use on these hides, as well as what kind of materials he would use, right? So when you look at this scene, what are some of the different images that you recognize? Let's start at the top. Who can tell me some things they see at the top? that they can call out by name. Alana, can you help me out? I see some people on horses and some bulls maybe. Right, they are buffalo. So if you notice, they have like that big hump on their back. So those are buffalo. And then yes, we have horses and we have people on horseback. So there's some horses all by themselves and then there's other um, riders on them. What do we have in the center? What's in the center that we recognize? Let's start with these yellow things. What are these yellow things in the center? Teepees, good. So we have teepees. And then in the center of the teepees, we actually have dancers, right? And so, in the very center, we have our dance, our dance here. And so these are predecessors to powwows. Powwows are typically where a group will kind of gather, right? And so here we can see center parts, these groups of dancers together. And the sun dance, right, which is being commemorated here is an offering to the creator, right? Buffalo were dedicated to the creator of the earth. And that's why there's so many buffalo all over the image, right? So this was to honor the spirit of the animal. Of course, the hides of these things would also be made out of um, things like buffalo skin or other skin like cattle skin, right? Now, the interesting thing to know is, and this kind of relates to what I was saying, is that he was making these for trade. By the time he was painting these, there were very few, if not, there are no buffalo left in this region due to over hunting, right? So he was recreating this glorious past and knowing that this is what people buying these hides wanted. They wanted to see depictions of Indians and buffalo, Indians, um, you know, on the hunt for buffalo. They want to see teepees. They want to see those stereotypical images. And so he's totally giving, uh, for my frankness, 
the white investor, the white tourist, what they want, right? And so here's a detail of it for you. You can see the dances. So you can see legs lifted high. You can see their faces in profile. You can see some feathers coming from the top of their head, right? At the very base, we have the buffalo hunt taking place where we have people um, running with the buffalo or people on horseback. And then we have women sitting around the teepees as well. So all part of the content of this, right? So traditional methods. Traditional methods for this would be to, to tan a hide and to use whatever colorants that were available to you. So using natural materials. Now, what he did is he used um, contemporary paint. So he would buy the paints that people would use to paint their houses, to paint you know, a painting. So he was using traditional paints or untraditional paints in order to make these. This is one that is in your textbook. So it's a slightly different example, but you can see very similar imagery. Here's some women by a fire. Here's a really good example of the buffalo. So this one was made by Cody as well, right? This one is actually also from your textbook, but this is probably a good example of the traditional hide versus the hide that's made with contemporary paints, right? These would have been more modern paints rather than traditional paints. Okay, so that is the end of Indigenous America. Any questions on that? Okay. Do you guys need to take a stretch for a second? Feel free to stand up, get it, grab yourself something to drink. Maybe I will. Now we're not gonna finish 87 today. We'll continue with it um, probably on Monday, right? But we're gonna move to Africa. So we are gonna have a quiz over Indigenous America and Africa together. And it's one of the reasons why I kind of slowed down and did a little bit more review today, because um, there's gonna be quite a few artworks and we wanna really focus on the differences. So when you're taking notes, especially in the African unit, I would really highly suggest trying to focus, right? Drink a little coffee, drink a little tea, try to focus on the differences because there's gonna be a lot of similar materials. Right, not necessarily today, but as we get to the masks and we get to other objects, we're gonna see a lot of wooden objects, lots of objects that are used for dances, but they have all different functions. And so we're gonna to have to really kind of focus on those differences. So today we are gonna start by looking at power imagery in African art, focusing on function, appearance, location, and technique. Okay, so the first area that we're going to go is in Southern Africa. And so we're going to a location called the Great Zimbabwe. Now, the country of Zimbabwe gets its name from this location that we're looking at right now, right? So based on the map, why do you think Zimbabwe was one of the most prosperous regions in Africa? So if you look, I put a close up here for you. Why do you think this, this region is so wealthy? Any ideas? Where is it located? What are all these gray things? It's a bunch of rivers. And so that makes it a great trade location, right? There's gonna be a lot of supplies being able to move in and out of this region, right? So the people of this region are called the Shona, right? So the name Great Zimbabwe means house of stones. These people who lived in this um, town controlled a lot of the trade routes in the regions on those rivers. So the rivers moved things like gold, ivory, and exotic animal skins, right? They also traded other resources that were considered to be like prestige 
imagery or prestige objects like pottery or bead work. So we just talked about beads in Native American. We're gonna also see some bead work in um, different regions of Africa as well. Um, they live in an area that had a, has a lot of green. And so this area is good for raising lots of cattle and other um, animals. And we think that the reason that this site was abandoned is because of drought. So those wonderful reasons why this was a great area of being really lush, it kind of dr dried up around 1450. So here is an aerial version uh, or aerial image of the location that we're gonna look at. Actually, I have this already, already, I forgot about. This is sorry. The Stone Kingdom, Great Zimbabwe National Monument. This historical site is surrounded by many large rocks. It's a vestige of a kingdom that once flourished in southern Africa between the 9th and 15th centuries. Zimbabwe means the House of Stone. The country was indeed named after this historical monument. The site built of large natural stones was a royal residence for the king. The stone wall is seven meters high. The earthen floor and furnace remain in their original state. The Shona people founded the kingdom. They came from the Sahara Desert, migrating southwards. They finally settled and founded a stone civilization here. The site had ritual sites and cemeteries. This was also one of the important places. A shout from here would have echoed right to the bottom of the hill. It was useful for passing on messages. town lay at the bottom of the hill. It had 6,000 houses, and at its peak, 18,000 people lived here. The kingdom was a trading stopover and became wealthy with gold mined in nearby areas. Between the town and the royal hill is a circular monument made with stone bricks. It's known as the Great Enclosure. It's believed to be either the queen's residence or a temple. Granite blocks were cut into the same size and stacked up from the ground. There are no straight lines or right angles. It was entirely built in curves. It shows that stone masonry techniques at the time were highly developed. A conical tower stands inside. It's shaped like a granary and believed to have represented the power of the king. The descendants of the Shonas, the original people who founded the kingdom, still live in this area. The once flourishing kingdom suddenly disappeared during the 15th century. However, the Shona people who founded the kingdom continued to recount their glorious days in song. Okay, so what we have is the great enclosure. But just to keep in mind that um, Great Zimbabwe is actually the whole sort of city area, as well as that sacred hill that they showed in the video. So this was a large stone complex um, in Africa. And this was actually um, the largest stone complex outside of Egypt in Africa, right? So um, this was really important. The entire city is kind of divided into three areas. It has that hill ruin that we saw. So there's these large um, rocks on the hillside um, that have a sacred cave, right? And they also mentioned that it would be good for like yelling at people from a distance. We think that was a ritual site. Then it has that great enclosure, which we have an image of in our 250. And then we have the valley ruins. And the valley ruins are where a lot of the people would have lived, right? Um, so 
we think that this was used around 1250 with that sacred hill and that sacred hill and sacred cave is still important to the Shona today. Um, this cave could have been part of the royal residence and their immediate family, like initially before something more major was um, constructed. And so that circular tower and circular walls that we have is this image that we have as part of our um, image set, right? But here you can see what it looks like from a distance. So in the video, they mentioned some of the possible functions of this, right? Um, does anyone remember what they said some of the functions of the great enclosure could be? Anyone write that down as they were listening? Right? One is it possibly could be a power or a temple, right? A temple. So the theme for today is power. How is power conveyed? How is power conveyed? It's a really tall and intimidating wall. Exactly. It has a very, very tall surrounding wall. And it is intimidating. When you see these little girls standing by it, you really get an idea about how tall this enclosure actually is. So not only is it kind of intimidating, but we have to think, okay, who paid for that to be made? Who paid for these intricately cut blocks to be placed? You know, they would have had to employ a lot of workers to make this happen, right? And such a lovely example. So like it's got all these cut rocks, but then it also has these beautiful patterns at the very top, right? So that's the part that makes it seem like it's not a fortress or a citadel um, because it's got decorative elements. If there is something that you thought would be destroyed by a warring faction or like outsiders, you wouldn't beautify it. Does that make sense, right? So it's probably a temple because it was beautified. This also could be part of the royal residence of the queen. And they mentioned that in the video. There would have been next to that granary, right? Or that tower that we see here, there would have been a platform. And that platform would have been a display of pottery made by women. And so this would highlight that purpose or the function that this could have possibly belonged to the queen, right? So all of this is speculation because they don't, we don't have written record of these people. A lot of this is passed down from um, an oral tradition, right? Um, it also mentioned the silo area could represent a granary, right? How would a granary convey power of a king? I put a contemporary granary for you guys so that you can have that as kind of a comparison. How would that convey power of a king? Cora, how would that convey power? It like shows how much like agricultural product you're producing. Right, so it would show the prosperity, it would show the fertility of the people, the storehouses. This king can't protect his people because he has grain and, and food on reserve. Right? So it'd be a symbol of his protection and power. Right. Um, so once again, just to make sure you know, this would have been made out of granite and it would have come from local sources, but this had no military function. Right. There's no evidence that it has any sort of military function. It has those decorative elements at the top that I mentioned. It doesn't have mortar. So just like the Incas, they didn't use mortar in between these stones to hold them in place. Right. At the very top, there would have been images of birds, right? What do birds represent to us? We've seen birds a lot. What do birds represent for people? What do birds represent? Right, birds could be representations of your ancestors, right? They kind of fly in the heavens, 
right? They oversee, they protect, so they are protector images. And so they were made out of sandstone, so they were carved out of stone rather than out of wood um, and were perched on the outskirts or on the perimeter of the central or the great enclosure. So it's really interesting how these stones are all curvilinear. There are no straight walls, right? So they're tall and they're curved, okay? The last place we're gonna be today is in Mali. And this is gonna be a nice review from us from our Islamic unit. And we have the Great Mosque of Denje in Mali. So in Mali, um, the empire that we're looking at um, was founded in Denje from around 800 um, CE. And their power was um, like most important, the height of their power was in the 13 and 1500s. Um, this was a major center of commerce, learning and Islam after the 13th century. Um, after it gained its power, the great mosque was um, built and it's been built and rebuilt over the different um, centuries. So I think there's four different versions of this mosque. It just got better and more grand as it went through, right? So I wanted to show you just a little bit about how this building is built. Um, in this region, mud construction is very common. Sometimes mud is used for houses, for building of houses, um, different city buildings as well. And so this was really common. So they adapted their local practices in creating a mosque, okay? And so we've seen this before. Remember how different mosques and the different decorations are all based on the region in which they are created, right? They're not all, they don't all look the same. So I'm gonna have us watch this, this video on how this is made. And then we'll talk about some of these contextual videos. Oh. So I had to edit this video um, because this was copyrighted. So please make sure that you watch this. So from this video, um, the contextual images that included on this slide shows you how it's constructed. So they acquire mud from this river. Um, they mix and make special mud for this mosque that has to be resurfaced every year because um, it is made from mud and covered in mud. And so of course the mud dries out and cracks or there's erosion during the rainy season. So what they do is they included these torrents, these embedded posts into the facade and they use ladders to scale the walls. And so they carry up these, um, basically these piles of mud that they form to this perfect mixture. And then they use it to face the, um, the outside of the mosque. So one of the things that you need to focus on is this contextual image that they've included. And so you could make a comparison maybe to the contextual image we saw at the mosque of Isifan when you think about how relevant mosques are to the daily life of people who live in these communities. So keep in mind that the mosque is in a central location and it's embedded into your everyday life. So it makes sense that the market is right next to the mosque, right? It's very convenient for people to go there for worship, but also notice how it stands out. It's on a podium, so it's elevated and is really large. So you can really see the power and prestige of the location. Here's a better contextual photo, right? Um, when you look at the mosque, hopefully you can tell what kind of mosque it is. So we've studied hypostyle, Qibla mosques, and or four Iwan mosques, excuse me. So we've talked hypostyle, four Iwan mosques, as well as central plan. And by looking at the plan, if you notice it has a series of aisles, hopefully you figured out that it is a hypostyle mosque. Um, very similar to like the mosque of Cordoba, where everyone is facing towards a Qibla wall with a mirab in the middle. From the outside, you can tell the mirab 
based on a tower that is located in the very center. Here you can see the platform, see how it's um, elevated and how you enter it up a series of staircases on all four sides. So the facade or the decoration on the exterior is very different from what we've seen at the Mosque of Cordoba. There's an entryway, but instead of being covered in decoration, it really does take on the regional style of Mali and Denje, where it has that mud facing with the torrents kind of sticking out, but then it has these kind of um, ovalid, these rounded peaks that are real common um, in this area. I believe that those represent egg forms like ostrich eggs in style. And then the interior is very typical of a hypostyle mask. mosque. You can see how those aisles lead you towards the Kiba wall, how the floors are covered in prayer rugs to, so the community can pray together. That is the end of today.